file. So let's get started. So here, when you go to part, uh, down below you could give it a file name and if you're in my course you could just call E1 for exercise 1. Next week will be E2, E3, E4, things like that. Okay, and go ahead and hit OK. And you could see the way Creo is developed. It's very similar to any Windows application. You have your ribbon up at the top here, which you could scroll through different options. Like we're gonna pretty much stay with model today and sketch, which you'll see in a second, but um, there are other tools. Also, you might see something on yours that I don't have currently up, and that's this, the toggle display filters. I'm gonna turn them on, and there you could actually see the planes and I'm going to show you how to adjust that permanently too and make changes. And over here on the left, this is the some call it a browser or it's a feature manager design tree. It depends on the system you're used to using or, or so on. But basically, what, we're, what this does is it's a roadmap of everything you do in the system or in this part. It's going to be history based so you could actually see chronologically how it was done and you could edit it as well and this is a fully what they call parametric modeler not only does it have history but it has the ability for sketches to be updated and changed as well as constraints that go beyond typical dimensions and we'll talk about that so let's begin first of all you could see you have front top and right planes as you select them here or you could select them out there in space but before we do that let's go to the options this is one of the options areas that's kind of like the heart of this system so if you go to uh, file and you go to prepare first of all go to model, model properties now model properties unfortunately I have my scale turned on because I'm on a 4k monitor so it knocked off the bottom of this and uh, oh, actually I could shrink it down okay there we go and so you can see here, you could actually select all sorts of things. So here's where units can be changed. So there were an inch pound second. When you click on it, you get the units manager. So you could switch to millimeters, gram second, kilogram, Newton. So things like that. But we're just sticking with inch pound second because we're here in the United States. I do prefer the metric system to be honest, but um, inch pound second just makes more sense to a lot of students and people out there in the US. So. Anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and hit close here. We're going to keep it as is. But then you also have mass properties. And now there's nothing in there. But if you go to change, uh, you could actually set your mass properties to a specific material. So you could go here to assign material. And then uh, we could go inside there. And there's like material properties. And there's a lot of options here. There's like legacy materials. Just click on that. And here's aluminum 6061. You click on that and you can select that as your material. If you want to double click and it shows up down at the bottom. Again, my screen is cutting this off a bit, so my apologies. And you could adjust, make adjustments to it. So if you have a specific material that's maybe similar to that, but maybe it has additional properties that aren't in this basic list, you could adjust those and put that information in and this carries over actually to the finite element analysis as well so it, there's advantages to that and it will tell you how much your part weighs when you're done so you could order appro appropriately anyway i'm going to go ahead and hit ok and it's set down there aluminum 6061 um, oh you know what and it's making me select the e1 part from the model tree and I'm gonna hit okay because we have multiple bodies inside of the part you could have up on the screen. You'd be able to select them from the model tree or I believe you could select it from the view screen as well. But go ahead and just hit okay and you could hit okay. Now brings us back, there's also um, accuracy, like how many decimal places do you wanna work within? And here you could uh, select absolute or relative. Uh, copy from an existing model, things like that. We're going to keep it at the typical right here. And finally, um, that's part of the settings. I'm going to go ahead and hit close here. Now, let's go back to file and go to the options menu. And here you'll see options. Now, this is a little different. This is a lot more complex, a lot more information in it. Let me, uh, I can't shrink it down, unfortunately, for you to see the whole thing. But this is going to allow you to select your 
for example, system appearances, your graphics and the colors and such. Uh, they have some really nice presets like model display here. Um, also with model display, I prefer my students, if, go ahead and put it in isometric. Trimetric's nice, but isometric I really enjoy as well. Uh, there's other options in here as well as uh, if you have a, a challenged computer, let's say you're working on a very old tablet computer that doesn't have a lot of horsepower, if you know what I mean. You can make adjustments to the, the shade quality. You could, if you have a very high-end graphics card, you could up that. I believe it goes up to 10. It actually goes higher. Uh, but just be careful. Word of caution, some gaming cards and things might not have drivers that are professional drivers. Like, like the graphics card I have is a professional graphics card. It's actually certified by these companies. Uh, whereas a gaming card doesn't go through the same certifications. I've seen it where um, I set a, a computer up. I had a very fast graphics card. I set it up very high. It was a gaming card. And all of a sudden my system started crashing. And so um, I went back, turned down the settings and everything worked fine. So just be aware, be careful. You could set, set them, but just remember you might want to adjust that. Now, uh, you could turn show datums on or off. There's a lot of really neat tools in here, but we're gonna keep going. Let's go to entity display, like um, edge display quality or the um, tangent edges. I like to see them as solid. And we have default geometry. Uh, they're shaded with reflections, which is really nice. That's what I had up. But you know, I really do like to see shaded with edges. I think for new students, that might be a good option. You'll actually be able to see the model. Those of you who are familiar with other CAD systems, to whatever you like, doesn't really matter. Okay, also anti-aliasing. This smooths the curves out. I'm gonna set mine up a little bit. Uh, and it gets rid of the jagged lines on thin lines and things and edges of models. So again though, be careful if you're on a, a weaker computer because this anti-aliasing can cause it to have some issues. Just remember to go back and change it if you do see your system crash. Okay, now um, that's about it. Let's see, uh, one other thing there's down here, there's customize and there's shortcut keys. Keyboard shortcuts are wonderful. And like for example, let's say we want fit, or there's refit. Click on that and give it a shortcut and just um, F. And that, when we hit F now, it will fit your model to the screen, and that's very useful. And I'm not going to go through any others, but note that you could customize it in here. A lot of really nice options. Now, at the very bottom, you have OK. And you can't see it on mine, again, because it cut off on the screen. And it's going to ask you this. Do you want to save the configurations? Yes, you do. And when you do save it, you could save it as a different configuration. You could call it, put your name on it. And that's a nice thing. Like, if you go to someone else's computer who actually has their own configurations and you like yours, you could either copy them on a, this on a flash drive and take it with you or on the network or just make your own and save it on the system. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit OK. I'm going to overwrite the existing one. And now we're ready to move on. So with this, I'm now going to go ahead and select the front plane. We want to start working. Now when you click on the front plane, the planes are what you use to sketch with. And so essentially, that's what you start off with sketching on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you right over here quickly. Some of you might be wondering, where can I find a training guide? Now the training guides, I don't always upkeep them that well, so just be aware. I, they're a little bit behind. Like, so you can see this one is version 8.0, but you could still use it. 9.0 has some nice changes. Nothing that would really tie you up though, other than offsets, that's new, and that's an exercise three that you probably run into some issues. But um, aside from that, most everything else is pretty much not changed a whole heck of a lot. There might be a few things. But anyhow, um, so there's the Creo Parametric 8.0, and this is, you can see here, it's for tanu1.com, and at the top you just go to instructional manuals. Okay, let me move this over a little bit. And you can see all your part files that you'll need for the labs and exercises that are coming up in the next five weeks. You'll find them right here. There's actually a, uh, you click on it. And what you do is you look for the white column. The white column of buttons, those are usually Creo. As you can see here, there's Creo. 
and even though it says it's up to 8.0, they should still work with 9.0 until I get it updated. All right, and then instructional manuals go back there, and there's Creo the Basics, and that's where we're at. You just click on that. That's going to bring you up this training guide in PDF, and you're you are allowed to print this out. Just don't resell it. That's all I ask. And so, if you go in here, there's actually a syllabus. It's similar to the one my students use, but don't rely on this those of you who are my students because yours is updated uh, and this is a very generic one ours actually has dates now here you could see the uh, there's links to like exercises and labs I actually made a full video up to version 8 8 through 6 and it's nine hours of every exercise and every lab inside Creo that we do and these are the links to it so the hyperlinks you could just go directly to them and then you'll see here are your point totals. So this is, those of you in my class, look on the one that's on D2L. Don't necessarily use this one because I think I've taken out and modified a couple of these, but the exercises are all correct. As far as the labs, I think I might have swapped out a couple, but just verify, make sure you're going through the D2L assignments instead of using this. But it does give you a good overview pretty much of the points, totals, and things, and like what, what things are worth. Now here's the what we were just going through, the interface. Look, that's the model tree. There's the ribbon icons, things we just discussed, the viewport. This also talks about the mouse buttons, like the left mouse button is used for selecting things and drawing. So when you draw a line, you click and then you click again, and it draws a line in between the two points. Uh, the right button is used for activating pop-up menus. So like just like here, if you uh, actually if you right click over here, you'll see the pop-up menus appear. Sometimes you have to hold down a little bit longer in earlier versions of Creo, like hold it down, hold the right mouse button down for maybe two seconds, and it's a little slow sometimes bringing up, and that might be due to its roots. I mean, this is a very mature CAD product. It came out in 1987. I started using it in 20, uh, sorry, 1995, so uh, I've been using it on and off for years. It's a very robust CAD system, one of the granddaddies of it, and they just it just keeps getting better. They keep improving it. So anyhow, you can see the right mouse button. Uh, yeah, like I said here, hold for two seconds. The center button is optional, used uh, to model the rotation, uh, which we're going to see 3D rotation in a minute. Dimensioning, zoom when holding the control key and pad. And dimensioning, remember that one. I'm gonna we're gonna hit, try and add a dimension. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait, if you click on the left mouse button, which you've seen probably on other systems, those of you who are veterans uh, to other CAD systems, you'll see that this doesn't work the same. You have to middle click the middle wheel. You actually click on it like it's a button. It also cancels commands and line chains and things like that. So uh, that's pretty neat. And then the center wheel, if you scroll it, it actually uh, is a zoom feature. All right, and we just went through the properties, and this shows you where to find those things again and it goes through some of the settings that I like to adjust and set. One of which I just remembered is very important and uh, let's cover that now before we go any further. Let's go back to File, Options and this one is under the Sketcher and if you scroll down, let's see here, oh here's num number of decimal places, bump that up to three that, uh, that will give us three decimal places. And let's see here, I believe. Let's keep scrolling down. This one, this is gold. Um, make the sketching plane parallel to the screen. Really helps out. Veteran pro engineer crew users aren't, no, they, they're, they're past it, they don't need to use it. But for my new users that I teach, you'll really appreciate this one. So make sure that one's on. And now you could go ahead and hit OK at the bottom again. That's all I wanted to really show you. Oh, uh, go ahead and save it. You just hit OK. There's some other settings. I think I showed you some of the colors, but that's OK. We'll go back to that. All right, so we're going to sketch on one of these planes, and that's typically how this works. And most CAD systems these days are based off of this. And really, this was the grandfather of this way of thinking, plane-based modeling versus some of the older CAD systems that were actually Cartesian-based, where you type in X, Y, and Z values. You don't have to do that here. And it was really groundbreaking for its day. But anyway, we're going to select the front plane to start our sketch. 
And now when you click on it, there is a quick launch, which we could have gone there too, but you have the ability to sketch or extrude. Those of you who are familiar with other CAD systems might want to start a sketch right away. And we'll do that first, but you could click on extrude if you knew that that was your plan, but go ahead and click on sketch. Now that we have the sketch started, you'll see that you get this cross, these crosshairs and you get this box, which is the plane. You know, I'm going to have you turn it off. Click on this little icon right here and uncheck select all. We will turn it back on from time to time, but to me, it's kind of a little, it's a little confusing sometimes for a new user. All right, now we're going to go and we're going to draw a rectangle. You saw that part we're, we're making earlier. If you hit the little arrow to the right of rectangle, you can see there's four different methods of rectangles. We're just going to go with corner rectangle. Now hover your pointer over the origin. Now to the right of your pointer, you get two little icons, and those are actually constraints that are automatically being positioned there. And we're going to talk about those in just a minute, but go ahead and click when you get those and drag to the upper right and make sure you don't get this symbol, the equal symbol. It's really nice. Uh, some people turn it off, but I actually like it on because sometimes I do like to make an equal all the way around box. But in this case, move, it up, move your pointer up a little higher and so that goes away because we don't want it to stay equal. We're going to make these dimensions for the width and the height different. So go ahead and click. Now, here's the interesting thing. It automatically dimensions for us. Watch this. On your wheel, click on it one time like it's a button. Don't scroll it and release. The dimensions should appear. Now, you get these really big dimensions, and we're going to adjust that. So double click on this one at the bottom, and you can see all the decimal places that goes up to very high precision technology. But let's go ahead and we're going to type in just three. You don't have to backspace on all that. Just type in three when it's all selected. And go ahead and hit enter. Now, notice it scaled this down, which is really nice. Double click on this and type in five. You do not need to type 5.000. In fact, after you're done with this course and you feel that you want to try and reach out and find a job opportunity doing this. Don't do that because typical thing when I was a manager and if I would uh, test someone, I wouldn't give them a long extensive test. I could know just by within a few minutes how, how well they are or how good they are at a software by little movements like that. If they went in and they typed in 5.000, it's kind of like, oh, they're a novice user. Okay, and I, I know where they're at. But if I see them like right away, just type in five knowing that when they hit enter, it automatically puts the decimal place and the zeros in afterwards. Okay, this person knows what they're doing. So it's gonna make you look really good in front of someone who might be testing you. All right, now that we have that, you can see these little constraints. Look at now, as we hover over them, this is point on entity, a point on entity, so vertical and horizontal, they coincided at that point and it's locked in. That's really your anchor point. That's kind of the origin that we have here. And it's um, you can put in additional WCSs if you want for other purposes, but really kind of stays anchored as do many of these these days. Uh, and it's a good thing, believe me, when I say that. All right, now you have constraints, horizontal and vertical. Now, if I were to delete these, you could just click on them and hit delete on your keyboard. You'd be able to move the line at an angle. All right, but right now it's stuck vertical and horizontal, and that's actually what we want. And that's the good thing about constraints and parametrics. All right, and you can see we have a whole array we could choose from up here, and we also have dimensions. So we could have added them manually too, if we wanted, and overwrote those, okay? All right, so we have our parameter set. Let's go ahead and hit okay. Now, the next thing is go to extrude. Now, here's how to rotate. Now you're gonna get the, this options box up. Let me dock it over here. Um, yours might be floating somewhere around. But you can see we have the box. Now it's turning to a solid and it's going four inches outward. Now to rotate this, hold the wheel on your mouse. Now actually first try scrolling, it zooms in and out and you could f make a focus point. Like I wanna focus in the bottom right corner there. I could keep my pointer fixed on there and keep scrolling and sure enough it focuses on it. But if you hold that button down, like hold it down like it's a button, the middle wheel, now you could rotate dynamically. And now you could see the direction. 
This little arrow will flip it backwards or forwards. We want it to go forward. Okay, and over here we could double click on this and change it to 0.5. Hit enter. And if you hit enter again, it will just apply it. We will talk about some of these other things earlier, but we could go ahead and just hit OK. Notice up here we could have typed them 0.5. Now some of you, if you ever get a surface as an option instead of solid, see how solid is depressed, surface is not. Surface is an open boundary condition, zero thickness surfaces or sheets. That is a more advanced type of modeling, usually for free form design, like if you're designing a boat or a car body, things like that. We do get into that more in, in the future, but not right now, not until like exercise eight. And we even make it a surface, a solid at that. All right, so make sure it's a solid. If not, just click on solid and hit OK. And now we have our model. Now to get rid of the green highlights, just click anywhere. When, when I say click, by the way, I'm always referring to the left mouse button. I rarely ever say left mouse button, but if we're if we ever need to right click on something, I will always say, I usually repeat it twice. So just so you know, right click, right click. And if you hold it down, remember you wanna hold it down for a little over a second. Just don't click, um, hold it. And then you'll see there's all these options that appear. So anyhow, so I'm gonna click and now you could see we have our geometry. Now try zooming with your wheel and focus on this upper left side and zoom. You can see, you can do that. now. Remember there's up here, you have refit and look at the little F in parentheses. Remember we programmed that key. Go ahead and hit F on your keyboard for fit and it will fit to the screen. So if it ever disappears off the screen, sometimes you just moved it out of the screen by accident. All right, so just hit the F key like I showed you how to program it or this button. Now here's zoom in. You could click on this and zoom in on a little area like that. You have zoom out, all right or zoom to fit. There's also refresh, so like a repaint, like if you have that, if you hit uh, repaint, it gets rid of the green colored surfaces that are temporary. Now over here you have ambient occlusion and scene background. Uh, you could just leave those as is. Over here you have shading with reflections. If you click that, you get a really nice picture. Like look at that, you can see the reflections at the bottom. Uh, some of you might not get it. I'm not certain if Creo uh, it needs to have a special graphics card or not, because I, uh, I have a professional graphics card and I've not run it on a non-professional graphics card in a long time. So um, anyhow, you might not get this. Instead, yours may look just like this, and that's fine, okay? So there's that, uh, that setting. Actually, that's one I like to have. There's even wireframe. Okay, and so you could tinker with those things. I'm gonna go with shaded with edges and control two is the fast key if you ever like to toggle between that. Now over here is the saved orientations. So if you wanted to go to front, it'll go to front. If you wanna to go to back, it'll go to the back and top. And so basically that's a nice little tool there. And you have some additional options, but standard orientation, we set that up as isometric. So it should go to this view. If it's a little skewed, it means that you still have yours and probably trimetric, which is fine too. It doesn't really matter if it looks kind of like this. That's fine. Uh, I just like isometric, that's all. I don't grade on that view. So, okay, and then you have the view manager and notice there's a camera. That's if you wanna save a specific view and we'll learn that in a few weeks, like I believe five weeks. All right, and then there's perspective. Now, you could turn on perspective and see what it does. It looks skewed all of a sudden, but what it's creating is a vanishing point. So just like a room gets smaller, the further you are away from the end of the, the room, that's what it's doing. And some people really like to work in perspective. I, uh, Creo actually does a pretty decent job with it, but sometimes I've seen dimensions, see how they're skewed. Sometimes we've seen the dimensions a little in areas that were confusing. So I generally, for my new students, I tell them, leave it off for right now. We turn it on when we make a rendering though. Okay, and then also you have uh, transparency control so you could set things transparent. Uh, we're not gonna fiddle with that right now. All right, and then there's these options like you turn off annotation or spin center. If you turn off spin center, what happens then? Wherever you put your pointer, it spins around that point versus you turn on spin center, it finds the centroid of the model. 
and it will spin about that by default. But you can click uh, on points if I recall. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. But anyway, you could toggle that. It's just personal preference. All right, so now let's go ahead and move on. I'd like y'all to go up to the this, uh, saved orientations and go to isometric, which is our standard. Default is the same as well in this case. All right, now select this front face. And this time we're going to use the tools that the quick launch. Now, if you move your pointer too quickly, this disappears. But all these same tools are up top in the ribbon, so it really doesn't matter that much. But I showed you earlier, let's let me move over here. Look at this, there's a sketch one and then an extrude and there's a sketch underneath it, and there's sketch one. So what happens if you go the route of starting to sketch first every time and extruding, it leaves that extra artifact of that sketch there. And some people don't like to clutter their tree with that, so they just eventually learn, like, usually you know you're gonna extrude, you just go right to extrude, and that will disappear, that, or that won't show up then with the next feature. Let's demonstrate. Go ahead and select this face, and right here is the same tool as extrude. Let's go directly to extrude, or the X key will take you there. Notice on the surface, since we selected it, it knows to orient itself, and now we could go and sketch, open up the sketch tools. Go to corner rectangle, and in this bottom left corner, click. When you get that little symbol there, that's good. That little square appears in the lower left corner, click. Now move your pointer over to the right and you'll see when it gets to the edge, it highlights the edge. It activates it, so it will snap to it. Look there in that little bubble to the right of it, it's finding a coincident relationship uh, or constraint on that edge. So if that edge ever stretches, and change always occurs in modeling, so will this. And sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't, but we want it in this case. So go ahead and click. But one other thing, what's this? That's the midpoint. We don't want it in this case, so stay below it. Click. And now, does anyone remember how to activate the dimensions? Okay, middle wheel click. And the dimension should appear. Now this time, notice we only got one dimension. Where is the bottom dimension? Well, that's gone. It's not needed because we created a constraint off of this referenced edge. And so the width of this is dependent upon the width of the base that we modeled. All right, so let's go ahead and just double click on this dimension and type in 1.5, hit enter. And now go ahead and hit okay. You can hit enter again in certain cases and it will hit okay automatically. In this case, it didn't. I'm thinking of something different, sorry. All right, hit the okay button, rotate a little bit. And here you could see this. Now, for conceptualization purposes, they give you this little handle. You could click on it and you get the ruler feedback. And you could use that for conceptualization or type in an explicit value here or up here. I'll do it up here this time just to show you. You have multiple options. Type in point 0.5. Hit enter. And now hit enter again. That's going to make me hit OK. Let's see. Yeah, it's going to make me hit OK. Trying to remember where that comes in handy. Uh, feel free to post it down below. There's so much I've learned and I've forgotten. Anyhow, so now we could see we have our model. We're getting there. Let's go ahead and now we're going to learn how to remove material. Select this face, go to extrude. Now, yes, the extrude not only could add material, but it could remove material. There's other CAD systems out there. Uh, that basically they've separated them to two different options. Here it's all in one, which I actually like. So anyhow, let's go to the circle tool this time, center and point. If you hit the little arrow to the right of it, you'll see there's concentric 3.3 tangent. Really, we're just gonna go with center and point. Hover in this upper left quadrant, click. Move your pointer out a little bit and click again. And then now remember how to bring up the dimensions, middle wheel click. All right, now we have, let me zoom out a little bit. We have this, which is the diameter. You see the diameter symbol there, double click. That needs to be 0 0.75, hit enter. Now we have this dimension, and let me bring it up here. 
and yours might be around one inch or so. That does need to be one inch. So it's one inch off of this edge. So double click, type in one, and enter. Now here we have an instance where it dimensioned it the way I didn't want it to. The automatic dimension is dimensioning to the bottom edge. And maybe I want to dimension to the top edge instead. And this is where, as long as the dimension is still weak, see if I hover over it says it's weak, I could change it. Uh, even if it's strong, you could still change it, I, sh I should say. Uh, and, and you could overwrite it, is what I'm saying. Now over here, you can see this one's strong. Now what's the difference between strong and weak? Well, strong means that when we go and add dimensions, it will not overwrite that dimension or override it. Whereas a weak dimension, which is this light blue color, it will just vanish once we put a dimension that trumps it. So let's go ahead and give that a try. Go to dimension, click on the center point of that circle, and I'll select this top edge. And you can barely see it's a little, it's a little orange, I believe. Click. Now, a lot of people think, oh, I could just click again over here to add the dimension for the height between the center point and the top edge. When you click with your left mouse button, nothing happens. Go ahead and middle wheel click. So the middle mouse button, it should drop the dimension in. Go ahead and just type one over that and hit enter. And now we have our position. Let's go ahead and hit okay. Now rotate again with the middle wheel, just hold it down and move your mouse left a little bit. Uh, feel free to st uh, stop the video and tinker. Mo move that around a little bit. See, if, uh, see how you like playing with it. But anyway, so we have a dimension here. There's some options like we could go to side one, side two, uh, extrude in the first direction, things like that. Well, first of all, we want this to be facing the other direction. I'm just zooming up to it. See that little arrow? You could click on that little pink arrow or you could click on this little button up here. There's a couple options. So I'll click on that. Now this is neat. Look at this. The AI that's built into here automatically knew to turn on remove material. So if it's going away from the model and it's going to add material, if it's going into the model, it just assumes, well, why would you want to go a, a solid into a solid? So it removes the material automatically, which is very nice. Now you can see here, there's also additional options like right here for the depth. We're going to go with through all. Now you could do that over here too. It's the same through all. This is, I just have this up. You may not even have this up on your screen. It depends. Okay. So through all and the reason why did I select through all? Well, you know, I could have set it because I know this is a half inch thick. I could have set it to a half inch, but remember in design, the world of design, things always change. And rather than, you know, trying to figure out how it's going to change or assuming it's not going to change by setting to through all ensures that no matter how thick this plate gets, let's say someone goes in, changes to one inch thick, it will always remain one inch versus if we only left that at a half inch, the part would then be incorrect until we fixed it to where it cut through a full inch. So that's something called design intent. And that was something I remember them talking about in my training years ago uh, in the 1990s. And it saves you time later on and it helps the next person who might open that model so they don't make any mistakes. Because you're like, yeah, well, one hole, I would see that, right? What if it's a part with a thousand holes and you miss that? And then it goes out into production. All of a sudden it goes out to the, you know, uh, the customer and, all, and they're like, wait, these aren't cut all the way through. That's the idea of design intent. Don't waste too much time thinking about it right now. If you're an intro learner, it will come to you naturally, but keep it in the back of the mind. Anytime you could optimize things, design intent is a good thought. Okay. Hit okay. All right. Now let's go ahead and go to this button here and go to standard orientation. And now we're going to put some rounds on. So go to the round tool click on it. Now with the round, you get some of these sets and such. I'm going to move this over. And at the bottom here, we actually see the radius. Oops, it keeps popping up down there. And I apologize. You can't see this. Let's see if I can resize it. No, I can't. But the radius, I'll show you one thing. You could just click over here and let's zoom up and you'll see it's 0.1 on mine. But if you grab one of those little handles and start dragging it, you could adjust it and you get the feedback. Go ahead and double click on that. Just change it to one, hit enter one time. 
Now let's say you want to add another one at that. Just go ahead and select this edge and it will remember the last setting. But you could change those if you want, make them different, but we, we actually want them to be the same. So go ahead, once you have those two, hit OK. Don't add any additional ones just yet. All right, let's put in some chamfers here and here. So find the chamfer tool and the distance, like see here there's distance times distance. And on a 90 degree angle, if the distances are equal, it will automatically be 45 degrees. Or you could go 45 degrees by distance or a specific angle to distance. So maybe you want it to be 16 degrees at 0.25. You could set that up there. A lot of nice options. We're just going to go distance to distance because it's easy. And 0.125. Now go ahead and select this edge here. I had to click a second time. Uh, and go ahead and select this edge here. You do get the drag handle, so if you want to make it a little bit bigger, you could, but I don't want you to right now. And go ahead and notice it goes clear across the rounds. And that's because there's tangent propagation, and that's an option you could turn on and off. We're going to leave it on, though. Go ahead and hit OK. All right, and so you can see our part is coming along very well. Now, rotation. Remember what I said, which button is it on your wheel? Oh, sorry, I gave, gave it away. The wheel, hold it down, move your mouse to the left, rotate and try and tinker with it until you get it like this, to where it looks like it's this orientation, kind of like a back bottom isometric view. All right. And so we can see these three faces because we're gonna remove those to make this a shell feature. So now go to the shell command. And go ahead and, uh, first of all, the shell, the wall thickness, you could look in here sometimes and see if you have any old values. In fact, there it is from the, the one I made earlier, 0.062, it remembered it. So I want you to type in 0.062 because you probably don't have it because you didn't model it earlier, most likely. All right, now select the faces you want to remove. So if you select this face, you get a wonderful preview. I love Creo's preview that they have. You get this grid. Don't worry, the grid will disappear once you're done. It's just showing you as a preview. Now, uh, if you click on the bottom surface, you see the top surface disappears. That's because you have to hold control and select both of those. And select this side face too. Now you could hold control and deselect or reselect the face and it will come back. So you have options like that. But this is what it should look like. And 0.062, hit OK. And look at that. We just shelled out our part. OK, let's do a little fun photorealistic rendering here. So for photo rendering, not all Creo systems have it. If you have like an evaluation version, it may not have it, or I've just heard that some students don't have this option. But go to View. First of all, putting colors on surfaces. You could go to Appearances, hit the little arrow. There's libraries, a couple libraries here of appearances. I'm going to go with the, let's see here, I really like the Chrome Plate. Click on Chrome Plate, you get the paintbrush, but before you select the face, over here is the filter. Instead of all, hit the little arrow, and mine went off the screen, unfortunately, uh, so you can't see it, but go for Part, and it's at the either at the top or the bottom of that list. And now click on the model. All right, now to activate it, push the wheel down one time, like it's a button. All right, and the color doesn't look like it changed all that much, does it? Not yet. Let's try something else. Let's go to appearances and let's go with gold or feel free to choose any color here. I'm gonna go with gold. Now over here, I'm gonna go on the filter, instead of all, I'm going to go to, let's see here, um, surface. And I'm going to select this one, this one. Oops, does anyone remember what button you have to hold down to select multiple objects? Control. Select this, this, this one right here, that one, that one, and the whole top and bottom. If you selected something you don't like, you could hold control and deselect it by selecting it again. All right. Okay, so I'm going to release control. I selected everything I wanted. And now I'm going to go ahead. Over here, you also have this, which was off my screen. I could go ahead and hit OK. 
And now you can see those colors have been added to our model. Let's go and now we could go to Applications. And you may not have this on your system, be aware. Render Studio. Go ahead and click on it. And you'll see re real-time rendering. Now, there we could see a preview. And if you rotate, it, you have to give it a little time, depending upon the speed of your computer. Also, over here, you could set it to perspective view here or there. And that gives you the vanishing point, so it looks more realistic. Now, there is denoise. You could select that. And that's uh, an option that takes out some only available on GPU mode. Interesting. I have not really used that. But anyhow, um, you'll see that there's real-time settings and so on. You could adjust. All right, and you might be able to hear the fan on my computer <coughs> revved up until it finished the rendering. It does use multiple cores. So like if I do a control alt delete and task manager and let's see here. As I go to the CPU utilization here, you could see um, it Oh, it's still using all the cores. Is that possible? I don't hear it rubbing. But let's turn off and on again. Yeah, I guess it was still using it. So you want to make sure you turn off real-time rendering when you're not using it or pause it. And you can see um, it's using a little bit of my GPU there, and that's probably just from the OpenGL and the memory and so on and so forth. Okay, so anyhow, moving along here, there's a photorealistic rendering. Now, those of you who are in my class, there's a couple things you could do. 